I just want to start with a question today. It's been bugging me for a while, and I want, I want to engage with you on it. I want to ask you what you think about this, all right? Does uh, the expression of faith, does our expression of faith change when you're talking about different generations, different eras, different cultures, different countries? Do you think that our expression of faith is different, yes or no? If you think it's yes, give me a wave. Okay, I saw some people say no. I saw some people say yes. And um, this is something that's been on my mind because, I mean, some of us have parents that are in this uh, church as well. Some of us have children that are in this church. And sometimes I wonder if the way it comes out, the, 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 the way we live at our faith, the way that we worship looks the same. You know, you go to some churches and they have a dress codes called your Sunday best. No matter what, when you come to church, you have to wear your best clothes, right? The worship leader goes up and, you know, for example, and you will see tie, jacket, slacks, you know, long sleeve button up, correct? And then you go to another church and then you have a worship leader who's got his hat backwards, you know, with a guitar, a leather jacket, and... Um, you know, ripped, ripped jeans. And I'm asking myself, it looks so radically different. Does it mean that both can be just as authentic, just as passionate, just as worshipful, just as faithful? And I want you to reflect on that today because that is something that I've been trying to chew on in this season. Uh, because um, especially when we're looking at how to reach out to the younger generation, are we supposed to reach out with the same methods as 50 years ago, as 100 years ago? Does it look exactly the same? Does it look the same in how we sing our music? If you go to the youth today, you know, and they're jumping around singing, Kamsa Hamida, all right? <laughs> you know, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, Kamsa Hamida. But they are jumping around and dancing. And I don't know if, you know, everyone in this church at every generation can go in there and enjoy that worship, the expression of faith looks different, you know, and so um, I started to read into it, and one of the things that came up is that the culture that the younger generation is immersed in today is so very different to the cultures of the past, okay, and I read up on this guy called David Kinnaman, he's the president of Barna Group, they do a lot of Christian research, very deep Christian research, and they, he talks about three A's of culture. Three A's, driving culture that the younger generations are immersed in. And I just want to touch on that uh, today so that it gives just a little bit of a glimpse into the world that, that we're growing up in now that looks very different. The first A is access. And this is something that everyone will understand because at our fingertips, you know, you take out your phones, at a tap of the finger, you have access to um, all the information, diverse perspectives, insights, all sorts of people, all sorts of products. You just have to tap a few times on your phone, on your tablet, on your computer, and you have access to everything. Correct? You get all the information today. You can go on YouTube and you can hear sermons that are a hundred times better than what I'm going to preach today. You can just, you know, check whatever I'm saying straight away as well. And this generation in the younger generation now is hyper-connected as well through technology. They can feel so connected to a K-pop star following their lives on Instagram, TikTok, and Snapchat, and they can feel more connected to this star than their friends in school. And so they're connected to so many more people through technology. They feel connected to these people. And then when they're surveyed, when you go deep into it, you realize that the, the younger generation today are more lonely, more isolated than any other generation before in terms of real, physical, deep, authentic relationship. And so while they are hyper-connected, they're also incredibly lonely and, and desperate for real relationship. The second A is alienation, and this is talking about the institutions that they have grown up with. And they have felt failure from all sorts of institutions. 
the government, I mean, we all trust the government today, right? The education systems, the, um, you know, our churches. We've never had any, any failure in our churches before, you know. And at every level of institution, they have experienced failure. Even the marriage institution has been under so much attack. All over, they would have read and seen and experienced moral failure, sexual scandals, corruption, money scandals, power abuse, ethical failure. And so they grow up with such a deep skepticism for institutional leadership and frameworks. And because of that, the, the last A comes out, which is authority or a lack of authority. They have a lack of reference points that they can rely on and trust in. They don't know which voice to listen to. There's a million voices out there, and they're asking themselves, which voice can I listen to? Which voice is authoritative? Everything seems to be eroding in authority, in, 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 in authenticity, in, in trustworthiness, in reliability. Where is our points of reference? Where is... What can we anchor on today? Is it a pastor? Is it a celebrity? Is it Kobe Bryant's quotes? You know? Is it Bruce Lee's quotes? Is it a movie star? Is it a teacher at school? Where are the points of authority that they can anchor on? And so this is very powerful because it shapes their mindsets towards uh, how they, they, they perceive things, their worldviews, their paradigms. And it will shape their mindsets and how they interact with faith as well. So I ask myself, how, how when they're growing up in this kind of, of, of culture, and I can see some of you thinking today, especially those with kids, oh my gosh, what kind of world is my kids growing up in? You know, it's, it's so much more complex than before. And I began to ask as well, um, what does this mean in terms of sharing our faith in church? Does it change anything? And once again, I went to a different uh, research done by Barna. Can we just change the slide? And there are some very uh, encouraging signs. This was a research they did mid last year that came out, okay? And I know it's a little bit hard to, 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 to read from there, but let me just tell you. The first question is, part of my faith means being a witness about Jesus the second question is, the best thing that could ever happen to someone is for them to come to know Jesus. They compared millennials, Gen Xs, boomers, elders. And guess what? Across the board, even all the way to millennials, there is no drop-off in people saying these two things are very important. That means that the, the younger generations nowadays are just as passionate about being a witness for Christ just as passionate about the, the idea that the best thing that could ever happen to those around them is to encounter the true and living Jesus. But you also find that there is a struggle for the younger ones to evangelize, correct? It's easier sometimes for the older generations to do that. And you're asking whether, what, what, where does this bridge? Because it, it's already seen that they have the same amount of importance and urgency towards the first two questions. Let's have a look at the third question to have, gain a bit of insight. It is wrong to share one's personal beliefs with someone of a different faith in hopes that they will one day, sh one day share your faith. And this is an interesting result because in the other generations, it's very, very low in terms of the people that think that it is wrong. It is ethically wrong to share with someone it, with the intention of converting them to your faith. But half of millennials, and that will carry over to the younger generations past that, the Gen Zs and the Gen Alphas as well, believe that it is wrong to evangelize, especially in the format that we've been doing it for the last few centuries. Isn't that interesting? Can we go to the next slide? So half of millennial Christians say it's wrong to evangelize. And this is something that I don't want you to be like, oh, you know, this is a wrong perspective. You know, I'm not, meant, I'm not meant to be here to trigger you. I'm trying to explain to you that this is the culture that they're growing up in that has made it so hard for them to evangelize. The culture that, 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 that prioritizes authenticity. Come as you are. You're allowed to have your own perspectives, you know. 
no one is able to criticize or judge you for your own perspective. At most, we can share what we believe, but at the end of the day, you know, you make the decision on whether you're going to believe or not. I'm not going to pressure you to do that. And this is very, very dominant in the mindset of the younger generations. And so, what does that mean in today's church? What does it mean in Glad Tidings? We've been in a season where we've been emphasizing evangelism a lot. Just last weekend, who do we have here? We had Pastor Tom, Eli, and he, he has a powerful tool, a, a wonderful tool to share uh, our faith with people. It's called One Minute Witness. It's one, it's one of the main tools that our church has embraced and, and uses. But you'll find that as you get to some of the younger generations, it's hard for, harder for them to use this tool. Because they're realizing that they don't want to jump straight into sharing the gospel before they know whether the, the person is at a place of readiness to receive it. And so, I'm not here to say I have answers today. But one thing that I have seen, which I want us to take note of, is that maybe we need to begin shifting the emphasis, not only to look at the destination, but also to look at the journey. Okay? Not only looking at the destination, but to look at the journey. Not only a destinational reference point, but also a directional reference point. I'm going to just very quickly go through this. This is my most wordy slide. You know, my wife hates it. She's like, why are you adding so many words on a slide? So the future slides are going to be much more succinct, okay? But this is just to give you an idea what it sounds like. When you have a destinational mindset, it says that only when you have arrived, you have made progress. Only when you have arrived, you are more mature in your faith, okay? Directional says you make progress when you're moving in the right direction every day. You don't need to reach that end goal before you can say, yes, I'm making progress. Yes, I'm becoming more mature, okay? The end destination is the main focus for destination, obviously. The direction you're heading in is the main focus for direction. Destination, you should believe in Jesus before you can belong to our church family. Directional, you can feel like you belong in church before you believe in Jesus. So can you start to see the shift in emphasis? The journey to receiving Christ is standardized and formulaic. It leads you to a place where you have to say the sinner's prayer. But then for directional, the journey to receiving Christ is personalized and non-formulaic, okay? And I, yeah, I hope I'm not here to make you feel very uncomfortable right now, but I want to start to introduce some concepts where we begin to say, hey, it's not only about sealing the deal. It's not only about getting them to the place where they can say the sinner's prayer. What if it takes three years of journeying and selfless love, you know, before they're even at any point open to the gospel? Where is your focus then? Do you still pour out selflessly into the life of a person who is obviously not ready, obviously not open, maybe even hostile when you bring up things of the faith? Do you spend any effort, any energy, any emotional energy, any compassion on them? That is the question I want to ask today. <clears throat> And I want to just clarify that it's not that the destination is not important because the direction ultimately points to that same destination. It's just a shift in emphasis. And so today's passage is a little bit interesting because as I was pondering over this issue, God actually led me to a passage in the Bible. A passage in the Bible where Jesus encountered a very skeptical person, a very doubtful person, a person who refused to believe. And you see very powerfully the heart of Jesus, the intent of Jesus for the skeptic. You see the invitation He gives to the skeptic. And you see the position He takes, which then makes us ask ourselves, should this be the position that we take as well? Amen? All right, so can we just rise even as we um, read the passage together. 
from John chapter 20, verse 24 to 29. I've put it up so that you don't have to turn to your Bibles, but if you want to, you can. I'll wait just for a few moments. This passage is very interesting for our church because if you realize it, it is immediately after our theme verse. And over the last, for, for January, for a few weeks, Pastor Vincent shared the vision of Glad Tidings for this year, the, the theme verse, and it's from John chapter 20, uh, uh, verse 20, 20 to 23. And so directly after that encounter with the disciples, there is another encounter with Thomas. Okay? And this is a famous uh, passage, but let's, let's just read it together. Are you ready? One, two, three. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Um, I think we missed out uh, one slide. Can we go back one? Yeah, this is the first part of this, the, the, the first two verses. I've ne we've never done this before. You know, I wanted to keep everyone awake. We're going to read backwards this time, okay? Are you ready? One, two, three. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Let's read the second part again because it was so powerful. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Before you sit down, let's just commit this word in prayer today. Lord, we thank you for your precious word. We know that you can speak to us in such a real and powerful way that you can cut through into our hearts whatever you want to say. Let your message take over today, oh God. Whatever you want to, to accomplish today, let it be done. Use this vessel, use my lips, use my words, oh God, and let your anointing be upon them because, God, it is all about you and it's about your presence today. So God, let your will be done. We open our hearts to you and what you have to say. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. You know, Thomas has been given a very infamous name in the world today, especially in Western cultures. Do you guys know what it is? Doubting Thomas, right? And you call that to people around you who find it very hard to believe. If you're working with a colleague that always needs convincing, you go and say, he's, he's a bit of a doubting Thomas. He's going to need us to convince him that it's a good thing before he agrees to take this initiative, correct? And actually, it's a little bit of an unfair title. Because if you read this, uh, the, the accounts from Luke and from Matthew, you realize that they talk about other disciples doubting as well. It's not only Thomas. If you read, you know, Matthew chapter 28, Luke, you know, 24, you will find that they will say, and the disciples doubted. Even after Jesus showed up and showed them his wounds, there were still disciples that, that doubted. It wasn't only Thomas. And so, it's an interesting story because John only has a short uh, amount to write. He's a short gospel, John, right? And so, he decides to add stories in for a very specific purpose. He decides to, um, you know, add certain encounters for a purpose. And we have to realize that 
when he has these encounters in, the revelation is not complete yet for some reason. Jesus dying on the cross, Jesus rising again, you know, from the dead, that somehow wasn't fully received by the disciples yet. They needed a series of encounters, you know, and, and, and things that happened after the resurrection in order for them to come to a fuller understanding, in order for them to come to a deeper understanding of what the cross meant, what Jesus' sacrifice meant on the cross, and what His resurrection meant for us. And so we have to ask ourselves, what is John trying to show us in this passage about a doubting Thomas? Okay? And let's put ourselves in the shoes of the disciples. They're in a place where they are hurt and confused and and in despair because their Lord, their Master, the one they thought would be the Messiah, has, has just died. Just recently, he rode into Jerusalem. Jesus rode into Jerusalem, celebrated, welcomed like a king. Less than a week later, he died in the most brutal, gruesome, mutilating way on the cross. And the disciples saw that. And they were, in a, they were wrecked. They were in a place of complete confusion and despair and hopelessness. And then suddenly, you start getting some really strange reports. Mary Magdalene runs to the disciples and says, I, I've seen the Lord. He is risen. And the disciples are skeptical. It's not only Thomas. What are you talking about, woman? Are you so emotional and so hurt and so traumatized by what you saw in Jesus' suffering and crucifixion that you are seeing ghosts? And then, you know, if you read some of the other accounts, he appeared some more to some of the other disciples. He appeared to Peter. He appeared to Cleopas and his friend on the way to Emmaus. That was that road with two of them, you know, that short road to Emmaus. And Jesus appeared among, among these two people as well. And so, these disciples, when they met in this room, in this secret room that they had to lock because they were afraid of the authorities finding them, you know, and catching them, they're scared and they're wondering what's going on. And all the disciples are there. I'm even wondering if, you know, you know how Thomas wasn't there the first time around? I'm wondering if he was there at that time, but he decided to sneak out because he was thinking so much. He, he snuck out. He made sure that, 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 I like to imagine these things when I'm reading the Bible. I'm sorry. He snuck out and he made sure that no, no, no spies are around. No one leads them back to the safe house. And he starts thinking, walking. Some of, some of us are thinkers and we need to walk when we think, right? You know, so uh, some of us are drivers. We like to drive when we think. Some of us are gymers. Where's Moses? Yeah, he likes to go to the gym to think. And, and so I, I, I think that... Um, I like to imagine Thomas is a bit of a walker, and he's walking, and he's thinking, like, what's going on? I've been so hurt. Jesus, the one I've journeyed with for so many years now, that I've seen his miracles, and then he's just taken away from us like that when we had so much hope in him. You know, and then what's this? This, this, this Mary Magdalene is telling me that she's seen him. Oh, my gosh, what is going on? And he goes back into the room, and the disciples pounce on him. And they say, um, Thomas, where were you? We have seen the Lord. It's true. He's alive. You missed it. We, we were looking for you all over. How do you think Thomas felt? Shock? Unbelief? Regret? Why did I have to be a walker, thinker guy? You know? Isolated? Do you know why he would have felt so isolated? Because the only company he shared, meaning the only other disciple that didn't see Jesus at this point of this passage, was Judas. And Judas was no longer alive at that time. And so that was the only company he shared because all the other disciples had seen Jesus alive and were excited that Jesus was alive. And in that situation, Thomas remembers in pain his Lord hanging on the cross and he, 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 he re, re, remarks in anger and sarcasm, saying, I do not believe. Unless he shows up in front of me, unless he shows me his, his wounds on his hands and his side, I will never believe. If you look at the words, he says, I will never 
believe. And this is someone who's walked with Jesus, one of the core disciples. He saw Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead. And these uh, other 10 disciples around him are probably one, some of his closest friends. For them to, to, to tell him that Jesus is alive, I don't think that, you know, they're trying to pull his leg. But you can see the level of skepticism and doubt that he was in because of what he ex had experienced. And I think that is um, something that we need to visualize when we read the Bible and try to see how things um, play out. And I guess what? That was eight days before Jesus showed up again. It said eight days later, they were in the same room again, locked in the same room again. So actually, even after the disciples saw Jesus, they're still scared. They're still in fear because they're still locked in that secret safe room to hide away from the authorities. Not much has changed in the external yet. And Jesus decides to show up for one person, for Thomas, when actually, by all logic, he could have just accepted the word of his friends, of those he had trusted around him, knowing Jesus, knowing his miracles, knowing and beginning to glimpse that he was the Son of God and the Messiah. You know, Jesus showed up. And we begin to catch a glimpse of Jesus' heart for the skeptic. He lovingly gives an invitation to the skeptic. And he says, I'm going to show up, not in anger, not in scolding, not in judgment. I'm going to show up in love and compassion. And I'm going to invite him to touch my hands, touch my side, and see for himself that I am alive. That is the compassion that Jesus has for this skeptic. And so we begin to wonder what God's intent is for us when we encounter people who don't believe around us. When we go into our workplace, is it just to earn an income for your family? But, or do you find that you will meet people who do not believe and who are not ready to believe in the workplace? This is something that I believe that when John wrote this story, he wants us to ask as well. What is our heart of empathy and compassion when we meet people out there who are in a state of unbelief, who are in a phase of unbelief? I want to read a testimony today. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is um, someone that I'm so privileged to call friend, so blessed to, to know him and his life. And, um, you know, for various reasons, he, he can't um, share today. But I'm going to share a testimony he wrote out, you know, in relation to this phase of unbelief. It goes like this. Just a couple months ago, I was not a believer. I was of a different faith. In fact, I remember being discouraged from getting to know other religions. I did not choose this faith because my family is of this faith. Automatically, I followed along. It seemed simple to continue to follow my family's religion, but at some point I realized I was left confused and wondering why it didn't work out for me. The sense of confusion in my heart left me seeking for truth. What is and who is the one true God? I went through a long season of soul searching for truth, seeking for spiritual guidance and strength in the midst of my questions. This search led me to explore Christianity, and as time passed, the belief that I had in my prior faith began to erode. As time passed, I met a friend who is a believer of Christ. And we had many conversations about faith, God, the teachings of Jesus, and the Holy Bible. This was all done in a casual and voluntary way, just like mates do. This led to the beginning of the turning point of my life, when after a while, this friend invited me to go to cell. I was keen to go check it out, even though I wasn't sure if it was the right move for me. I was not a believer at that time, and I didn't want to impose on anyone. My friend assured me and explained to me what cell is about. 
fellowship, prayer, and Bible study. And with those assurances, I said yes, and I went. So on 26th of July, 2019, I attended my first cell meeting. I felt awkward in the beginning because I didn't know what to expect, but through God's grace, I felt so secure and sheltered in the group that I met. I was so touched by the circle of fellowship among believers who shared and guided me through singing praises, prayers, and Bible verses. This helped me to get to know the true God, open my eyes and my heart to begin to believe in this one true God. Then they invited me to service, and did I hesitate? Nope. An immediate yes followed. I even made excuses with other appointments so that I could always make it to service. Every time I'm in church, I feel at ease and at peace knowing that I am in the house of the Lord and that He is here looking after me. And then I experienced something amazing. A pastor prayed for me about what is plaguing inside me. I had never told anyone before, but yet the pastor knew about it. This was such a clear sign to my heart a sign for me to see the glory and grace of God in my own life. This gave me the encouragement to seek more for faith in God and to believe in Him. After coming to cell and services for quite a period of time and witnessing everyone taking communion together, I felt there was one missing piece in my life. This piece was accepting Jesus. So after looking back over the months of attending cell, services, and spending time with the new friends I had met, I felt that the time had come for me to embrace Jesus as Savior. On 7th November 2019, I made that leap of faith. I embraced and accepted Jesus as my salvation. My cell leader guided me through the process, and it touched my heart deeply. As soon as I received Christ in my heart, I felt a big weight lift off my shoulders. I felt free and liberated. The feeling was so good that my eyes went all crystals teary on my drive back home. But fortunately, I got home safely and had a peaceful night of rest. So what happened next? Simply put, after accepting Christ, I felt so at peace and so calm. I felt that I was stronger, more purposeful, more fulfilled. I was, it was satisfying to know that I had made the leap and begin to start my daily life with hope and strength. I totally have no regrets on the decision that I've made, no turning back. In fact, it's the best decision I have ever made in my life. I have never felt so grateful and happy before. I'm thankful that I managed to seek God and that in His grace, He helped me to open my heart and to accept Him and connect with Him. Every day I will begin and end my day and night praising Him and thanking Him for being there for me and for caring and loving me unconditionally. He will always dwell in my heart. Praise the Lord. Amen. This person's journey was not just about the end destination of saying the sinner's prayer. Somebody walked with him over such a long period of time. Someone saw his questions, saw his curiosity, spent time with Him, journeyed with Him, loved Him with a selfless love, invited Him to come and meet a family of God that was non-judgmental, that could pour love into His life. And then at some point when He was ready, He said, I'm going to follow Jesus. I want to ask a question today. If a person who was not a believer, who was skeptical about faith, came into this church or walked into the cell group that you're in, connect group now, um, would they feel welcome? Would they feel welcome enough to stay for one year and journey along with the group? Would they feel that they're not judged? Would they feel that they have the space, a safe space, to engage with faith at their pace and how God is speaking to them at that point of time? I hope this encourages you of what Jesus is getting at in terms of how he had such an open heart and invitation to a doubtful, intensely skeptical person. Amen? Secondly, I want to talk about something that um, 
jumped out as I read this text. And I want to clarify that sometimes when, when we preach from text, it's not uh, claiming that this is what John meant. I don't think John meant this at all. But sometimes as we're reading, God begins to hammer in a prophetic word from, this, from the text that you're not meant to use to interpret the text in future, but it's for today. And this word kept coming out, this sentence kept coming out, some wounds never heal. Jesus, when He showed up to His disciples, He showed up in His perfect physical state, His resurrected body. It was already His perfect being. Everything, physical, everything. It was different to the extent that even His disciples found it hard to recognize Him. Cleopas and the friend didn't even recognize Him on the road to Emmaus until at the end. When they went fishing at the end and, and, and Jesus was on the shore, they couldn't recognize Him as well. He was in His perfect physical state. His whole being was perfect once He resurrected. And Paul in 1 Corinthians says that is how we will get resurrected as well in future. But in that perfect resurrected state, did you ever ask why He kept His wounds? Did you ever ask why His side still had the, the hole in it? His wrist still had the hole in it? His feet still had the holes in it for His disciples to see and touch? Sometimes our wounds, we want to hide it, right? We want to hide our scars. We are ashamed of them. We may be embarrassed of them. And if even, even when we have healing, we wish to have the healing to the extent that the healing is so deep that, um, that it's as though the wound never existed, correct? And even in this story, I can imagine that it was a little bit of a wound or a scar to Thomas. When John wrote this gospel, it would have been at a time when they were still setting up the early church and Thomas and, and John would still be buddies, right? And I can imagine, like once again, I'm so sorry, I like to imagine these things. And so I can see Thomas going up to John and reading the first draft and nudging him like, hey, buddy, this part, could you leave this story out? I'm a bit embarrassed about it. Can't he just say that he showed up to the disciples, we were overjoyed, and we saw the full revelation of, of God through the cross, through the resurrection. Can you please leave it out, you know, for old time's sake? I take you out for it, Theo Aislima, and you can leave this little bit out. I get it, you know, I'm very imaginative. And, um, and I can see John just saying, my brother, don't you see? This story is important. It shows God's heart to those who do not believe. You know, it shows that he wants to invite them gently, lovingly into his presence. It shows that part of the revelation of the cross is that God came for all, not only those who are ready to receive, not only those who are super open, super hungry. God came for all, and He gives that invitation to all, regardless of how open you are, He has that loving, compassionate invitation. And then Thomas will be like, wow, okay, la, win um, if you say it like that, you know, he will say, he said, fine. I see it, what, what you mean there, what you mean now. Leave this scar in. Don't hide it. Let this scar glorify Jesus. And I don't know what scars you carry today. I don't know what scars you want to hide today, what scars you are ashamed today. But God can use it in a way that points to Him and His glory every time. Amen? And I'm not talking about the scars where you are still bitter and unresolved and then, you know, the world sees all that bitterness. You know, I'm talking about the scars where you have come through, that God has brought you through, that you have faced that pain and He has ministered so deeply, healing into your heart and your soul. And you can stand there and say, Look at this scar. I am victorious because Christ is victorious. And our scars can do that. You know, I've told this story before um, where when I was young, um, not by any fault of my, my, my family and my parents who showed up. I didn't even tell them that I was sharing today. You know, they're right at the back. 
And I shared that uh, before in a previous sermon that when I was uh, very young, uh, for various reasons, I had to live with a different family. You know, and so this family told me over and over again that I was not loved by my own family as, as, as a small child, um, that I was not wanted, that I was discarded by my family. And I grew up feeling such a sense that I did not belong to my own family. You know, and at, and at this point, I've gone through a, a deep healing from that. You know, my mom and I, we used to fight so much, but she's now one of my best friends. Really one of my best friends. Closer than, you know, a lot of my close circle of friends. Levi, <laughs> he had dinner with us last Sunday, and he was like, man, Roger, now I understand you a bit more. I should have bought popcorn to watch your conversation over dinner. Because I'm telling you, the way we joke with each other, we can tell each other brutally, uh, in a brutally honest way, the way that we think, whatever one of our thoughts, we can make fun of each other, you know, and we can come out loving each other even more. That is the healing that God has brought to my family, you know, and I'm not going to give the details because I've told it before. But through this scar, let me tell you the truth. The things that have to do with family and belonging trigger me like nothing can trigger me. If I see situations where families are breaking down, or marriages, or children, or people do not belong, it kills me. And I am compelled to reach out to them. And even the last two years, my wife and I has made it a point to open up our house to people. Over and over, we, you know, many of you would have stepped into to our home before. Actually, the last two months, we did it a bit too much. We've been on overdrive, you know, three or more times per week for the last two months. We have had people in our house. Anyone who needs to talk, anyone who needs a person to hear them out, anyone who needs a warm meal, anyone who needs a warm hug, we have hosted them. And that is what we have wanted our home to be, a safe space of healing, a safe space of trust, a safe space of restoration. And no matter how tired we've been this last two months, I mean, we've talked about it. We, we have told each other we don't even regret it for a moment. We love you. Whoever has stepped into our home, you are family. You are family. And this comes out of the scar I had as a child where I felt I, couldn't, I did not belong to my family. God will take most painful of scars if you would let him. And it will compel you to his purposes. And that scar will be so visible to the world, but it will point to only one person. Amen? Amen. My last point is from doubt to delight. In the passage, we saw how Jesus responded to Thomas the skeptic. You know, how must Thomas have felt when Jesus came into that room? Once again, I'm imagining. Once again, I apologize. <laughs> I'm thinking he's hiding behind the other disciples. Oh, crap. Oh, crap. Jesus is here. I've been so skeptical when He has walked with me, journeyed with me, shown me that He could raise the dead in Lazarus, healing uh, two fish, you know, five loaves, feeding 5,000 over and over and over. And He has told me over and over that He's the Messiah. My friends and closest brothers are, are, have been telling me that they have seen Him, but yet I have not believed. And so I think He's hiding back there behind. I don't know, I think Peter's probably the tallest and he's just behind there. And he's like, oh my... He's just looking down and he's like, 
Jesus, I'm so sorry. And he's like, whatever comes, I will take it. If Jesus scolds me, Jesus admonishes me, you know, for my lack of faith, I will just say, I'm so sorry, Master. You're right, you're right. And then you see Jesus' response. He opens his arms and he says, Thomas, look at my wounds. If you need to, touch them for yourself. Touch my side. I am here. I am here, Thomas. That is compassion. That is Jesus. He could have been frustrated. He could have said, Thomas, man, what's the use of discipling you all these years? You are my 12. You are my closest 12. You have failed me. You have disappointed me. That would have been justified, right? So justified. But instead, he poured out his compassion and gave that invitation to someone who would not believe. This is Jesus' heart for the skeptic. This is Jesus' heart for those who do not believe. Just in December, I went to uh, India for a missions trip, and um, there was a driver that was assigned to us by the church for eight days. And so we spent a lot of time with him. He wasn't a Christian. And it was actually a little bit dangerous at this point in time to, to, to do missions and work, uh, church work in India because the new government that took over is very anti-Christian. Um, they just passed an anti-conversion bill. You know, they have ex fundamentalist extremist groups that are beating up pastors, tearing down churches. Uh, very, very uh, dangerous right now in certain parts of India. And so we spent time with this van driver. Can we change the slide? Yeah, see how good looking he is. Yeah. We spent time with this van driver. And uh, as the days passed, you could see a shift in his heart. Because when he takes us for the missions assignments, you know, he, we, we will have our worship and our preaching. He will either stay in the van or he will stay very far back outside the church. You know, 20 meters outside the church. And he's just hiding behind a pillar once in a while listening in. And then halfway through the trip, he began to share. And he said, I'm so blessed to have met you guys. I'm so grateful that I met you guys. There were two uh, assignments that I could choose. Either it was yours or, or another one, which I sleep, you know. And he said, I'm so grateful I chose yours because I believe there is a purpose that is going to happen here. And he began to share. He said, three years ago, my 16-year-old daughter committed suicide. Because of grades, you know, they, they have this thing with family honor. And so when she did badly, she felt like she had failed the family. And even though they didn't put pressure on her, she committed suicide. And that family was filled with such despair and hopelessness. He's got another son, but they had been growing up, you know, the last three years with just despair. And he just began to pour out his heart saying how difficult it was for him. And I remember one day outside our hotel room, we were having breakfast. And he just got on his knees and he says, I want to follow Jesus. And I want to get baptized. Would you pray for me? And this is in a, outside of the hotel, meaning the staff are walking all around. It's in public. It's dangerous. And he's just on his knees declaring, this is I know there is something here. I see that there is a hope in this path that you guys have been preaching about, talking about over the last few days. And he began to, he began to, um, to just say this in his prayer. Brother Michael uh, Tang led him through that prayer. And a couple of days later, I went to a church in Tinivanam and, um, and preached, and he was on the front row he was on the front row. And as I preached, I began to realize that I was only preaching to one person. There was 120 people in the room, but I was preaching to him. And I felt God saying, you are preaching to this person. 
because I began to share, when you follow Christ, you change your destiny. Not only do you change your destiny, you change the destiny of your family. Not only do you change your destiny of your family, you change the destiny of your children and your children's children in future. You have changed the whole destiny of your family when you say, yes, I will follow Christ. I will follow Jesus. And his face was just engaging, filled with hope. Standing at the front row, he's, 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 he's so hungry to hear the Word of God. From doubt to the delight, from despair to joy, this is Jesus' invitation to those who do not believe, to those who are not ready to believe, to those who have been going through so much pain that they don't even know how to believe anymore. Amen. Thank you for watching. Subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out on anything new and stay connected with us on our social media. Click here to watch our previous sermons.